So good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, today is the first lecture uh, of the IEEP chapter from uh, Northeast Northeast Brazil session. Today we have the pleasure to receive uh, Professor Etienne Perret. So uh, before to begin the presentation, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Etienne Perret. He is a senior member and uh, has had the engineer degree in uh, electrical engineering from the Ecole Nationale Supérieure d'Electronique, d'Electrotechnique, d'Informatique, d'Hydraulique et des tel Télécommunications Toulouse, France, in 2002. And the master and PhD degree is in electrical engineering from the Toulouse Institute of Technology, Toulouse, in 2002 and 2005, respectively. From 2005 to 2006, he held a postdoctoral position with the Institute of Fundamental Electronics, Orsay, France. In 2006, he was appointed associate professor of electrical engineering at Grenoble INP, Institute of Engineering, Université Grenoble Alpes, France. From 2014 to 2019, he has been junior member with the Institut Universitaire de France, Paris, France, an institution that distinguished professors for their research excellence, as evidenced by the international recognition. From 2015 to 2020, he has been an appointed member of the French National Council of Universities. He has operated and cooperated more than 200 technical conferences, letters, and journal papers, and books, and book chapters. He holds several patents. He works, his works have generated more than 3,500 citations. His current research interests include wireless communication system based on the principle basket uh, modulation or basket layering of electromagnetic waves, especially in the field of RFID and chipless RFID for identification and sensors. His research interests also include electromagnetic modeling of passive devices for millimeter and submillimeter waves applications and advanced computer-aided design techniques based on the development of an automatic co-design synthesis computational approach. Dr. Perry has been a technical program committee member of the IEEE Inter International Conference on RFID, the IEEE RFID TA, and currently he is a member of the IMS Technical Paper, Paper Review Committee. He was a recipient of several awards like the MIT Technology Reviews, French Innovators under uh, 35 in 2013. The French Innovative Techniques for the Environment Award in 2013. The SE and IEEE Leon Berlin Award for his outstanding achievement in the identification of an object in an unknown environment using a shipless label or tag. The IEEE MTTS 2019 Standing Young Engineer Award, le, the Prix Espoir MT Academy des Sciences in 2020, and the Grand Prix de l'Electronique Générale Ferrier in 2021. He was a keynote speaker at the chairman of several international symposiums. Ken Perret was awarded the ERC Consolidator Grant 2017 for this project, Scattered ID. So, one more time, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. So we can begin uh, when you want. Thank you, Alexandre, for this kind uh, introduction. So I hope that uh, you heard me well. If uh, there is any problem, don't uh, hesitate to tell me. Huh? So today, I will speak about uh, cheapest RFID. Uh, first, I will introduce uh, cheapest RFID uh, with comparison with the classical identification systems like uh, barcodes and uh, uh, UHF RFID. Then I will present main issues in the field of cheapest RFIDs. And uh, at the end, my third part will be dedicated to results that we have obtained in this uh, so in the project scatter ID, uh, so related to this uh, field. So 
you can see this uh, very sm small uh, animation here. Uh, it illustrates very well what is uh, the concept of uh, cheap tracer FID. Uh, we send uh, a pulse uh, and and we try to uh, detect the backscatter wave from uh, objects and of course more exactly from tags uh, that are in front of uh, the reading antenna and based on the backscattered signal the idea is to detect several things first the identification of the id and also some uh, sensing things that we will do that i'm going to present so first i will speak about the principle of operation and uh, let me introduce uh, cheap tracer fid uh, so for that we have to speak about uh, classical RFID, uh, RFID, so radio frequency identification uh, is one of the major technologies in the field of identification. It means that there are thousands of applications in this uh, field that are covered by RFID. And due to this high number of applications, there is not only one kind, one technology in RFID, but several of them. Uh, it's what we can see on these slides. Uh, for example, to answer questions uh, relating to different constraints, in terms of size, cost, reliability, we can find so different kind of RFID. And today I will speak about cheapless RFID, which could be considered as one of these different kind of cheap tracer FID technology. So, as you can see here, again, the main principle is a, a radar approach. We consider the, the uh, label as a radar target, but of course the main difference with uh, classical uh, use of, of radar is that in that case we design by ourselves the, the label, usually by uh, the design of a metallic pattern, a specific metallic pattern. Most of the time is some re we, we are trying to, to realize uh, resonance scatterers. You will understand why after. And uh, due to that, we uh, are able to detect this, the, the backscatter field from this label who uh, have some specificities that we want to uh, retrieve in order to uh, detect many things like the ID. So of course the main advantage is uh, for example compared to the barcode uh, is that we don't need any direct line of sight. Uh, we can of course uh, uh, give uh, an ID to any object on which the tag is attached. Uh, this kind of label can be printed uh, with, of course, metallic ink. And uh, uh, we can have many new functionalities compared to uh, the barcode, and we will discuss about that. So what is important here is to understand that when I speak about cheapless RFID, mm -hmm. this is totally different from UHF RFID for many different aspects. Huh? The fact that we don't have any chip uh, means that we will not follow the same, for example, protocol or even a frequency band uh, in order to interrogate our tags. And of course, it means that the reader is totally different. Huh? In our case, as we can see on this illustration, we need a reader which is close to a radar so we need to be able to send a pulse and to detect the backscattering wave, which is totally different from classical RFID reader. Um, so now I will introduce a bit more what is GPS RFID. One thing important to understand is that, um, again, uh, it's totally different from UHF RFID. Uh, we, the main idea is that uh, without any chip, we cannot modulate 
the, the backscattered signal. And when we don't do any modulation, the first important things is that we cannot apply the classical radar equation. So it means that if we want to compute the read range of GPS RFID, it's not possible, like in UHF RFID, to use the classical uh, radar equation, but we need to introduce a new one. Uh, it's what we have done in a recent paper that you can see here. And this, the main difference here is that we have to take into account to the environment. The presence of the environment is very important in GPS RFID because, of course, we send a continuous, um, for example, if we send a continuous wave at F0, the, the, the main impo information will be backscattered at the same frequency. So there is no isolation in terms of frequency as we can do, uh, as, as we can have in, in uh, UHF RFID. And the one main consequence is that we cannot use the radar equation, whereas the main hypothesis of the radar equation is that we are in free space. So we cannot consider in GPS that we are in free space. And depending on the, overall, on the environment, we will, the read range could change a lot. So I have some illustration about that. It's a, a, a simple analogy that we can do. So just to present this idea of uh, the effect due to the environment in the backscattered wave that we want to save, uh, we can Consider that to detect the GPS tag that you can see here in a real environment, it's, it's like if we try to detect this key in an environment like that. So if you look at that, you will have a lot of difficulty to see where the key is. But now if I consider UHF RFID, Due to the backscatter, the, the modulation, the fact that we, the wave, uh, the, the states of the backscatter wave will change between two states, so we introduce a modulation, we have, uh, it's much more simple to detect the tag. So this analogy uh, shows something that we can, of course, uh, uh, what we observe in, uh, in GPS RFID is the difficulties to detect the tag in real environment and why also the read range is reduced compared to UHF RFID. Today, UHF RFID, you can have read range up to 10 meters in real environment. In GPS RFID, we will speak about a few tenths of centimeters, so which are very small compared to UHF RFID. So now if I continue this analogy, of course, if I change the environment and I consider an environment which could be very similar to a semi anechoic environment, uh, in terms of analogy, we will have something like that. So of course, when we have nothing in our environment, it's much more easy to detect the key, huh? and it's the same for a cheap less tag. Uh, depending on the environment, the difficulty to detect the tag is totally different. And of course, it means that the read range is also totally different. In an uh, anti environment or so an echoic environment like that, we can have read range up to one, two meters, but uh, it's reduced to a, a few tenths of centimeters, as I told you, in the environment. Another way to, to really see uh, this, with, uh, in this case with, with uh, clear uh, RF signals, is uh, this, uh, this slide. So here, you just have the backscattered field that we have saved, for example, with an oscilloscope huh, from this tag. And more exactly, you have two different things two different curves. One is just without the tag. So it's just due to the presence of all different, uh, all the environment, so different uh, uh, box or support that you have in front of the antenna. And the other, the other one, 
So uh, in dash in a, a plain line, uh, no, in point is with the tag. So it means that the useful information that will be used to detect the tag is in the difference between, between these two signals. And it's why we can see that in real environment, the effect due to the tag is quite small compared to the environment. And the, the, the consequences of that is that we need to develop to introduce specific uh, techniques in order to be able to read the tag in real environment. And now I will present different approach that we have introduced uh, these uh, last years in order to uh, to be able to read tags. Uh, in terms of comparison, so everyone knows about the barcode. Huh? Uh, it's easy to use, universal, low cost, very low cost, in fact. So these are the advantages, but uh, the bad things are relating to the short read range and the need of direct line of sight. And now if we do the same comparison for UHF RFID, in fact, it's a bit uh, different because the drawbacks that we wear we have where with the barcode is some advantages because of the use of RF waves. It's much more easy to increase the read range to, of course, to be able to have multi-read. And uh, we have a, a kind of flexibility in terms of reading, reading uh, about orientation of, of so, about the tag orientation. But there is also some uh, bad uh, things, which are the cost, the presence of a ship for environmental issues, for example, and of course the fact that it's not in universal in the, for example, in the frequency bands that we have to use for UHF RFID, who are uh, different, di different. Uh, 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 they are specific to the country uh, where the solution is, is used. So now, if I, I introduce GPS RFID in terms of uh, uh, comparison, we will see that we are somewhere between these two main technology. And what we will see is that we, we, we cannot have better performances, for example, compared to the UHF RFID, because of course we don't have any chip. But you will see that we have some cumulative advantages uh, between the two. So here you can see maybe the, the first generation of GPS tags that has been uh, introduced. Um, so, as you can see here, that there are many, uh, there are different kinds of tags. Huh? Uh, what I would say is that in, uh, the first GPS tag that has been introduced were more like this one. It, it means uh, with one or two classical antennas that we are here, huh? we are in cross polarization. And uh, between these two antennas, most of the time we put some resonators in order to add the identification. So this was the first GPS tag that has been introduced. But in our group, uh, from my side, what I have introduced is uh, the idea of using not a tag composed of antennas, but only composed of resonance scatterers. So of course, in that case, we, we generate signals who are similar, but with better performances in that case, and based, of, based on the resonance frequency of specific shapes that has been designed here. So of course you can see different shape. Uh, we will have 
many examples in this presentation. We can see also here that um, it's possible in order to reduce the cost, uh, which is very important in terms of application, to realize this label on paper or plastic PET with uh, conductive ink, as is the case of this one. And there are also much more uh, um, work, dedicated work that has been done, but at much higher frequency. Huh? For this classical one, we use uh, UHF, uh, UWB frequency from 3 to 10 gigahertz. Huh? But if you go higher in frequency, so in the terrorist band, for example, you can even encode information without any metallic uh, layer. So, for example, this tag has been done only by changing uh, the dielectric constant uh, with different kind of layer. So, what is important here? If we compare classical RFID with barcode, so in terms of item level tagging, read, um, reading, reading range, uh, multi-read, discretion, writing capability, product integrity, it's clear that uh, RFID offers a rich spectrum of services. Huh? And it's not the case for barcode. So from this comparison, it, we could uh, imagine that barcode will disappear or oh, would already has disappeared due to this uh, low performances, of a low functionalities number. But in fact, it's not the case, of course, at all, huh? because uh, even now, uh, for example, 70% uh, of manufactured product have barcode, which is uh, a very huge number of parcels in the world. And the reason of that is that the things that are, maybe, that are maybe the most important in terms of comparison was not in this table, is maybe uh, the cost, which is very important at the end, and also the flexibility of realization because of what everyone can produce his own barcode with a simple printer of, RF, of RFID where we need to add a label. So now, if I introduce in this table, t you can see that I put it between RFID and barcode. And I also add some formation. So what you can see here is that we will never have better performances than with UHF RFID, maybe only in terms of discretion, huh? because of course we don't have any chip, so uh, we, we can hide totally the, 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 the pattern. But of course, we are not able to uh, have uh, as much as information as uh, in UHF RFID, we cannot uh, do multi-read. Uh, the read range is, of course, uh, lower, as I told you. And it's almost the same for everything except the cost, because without any chip, with the possibility to print the pattern directly uh, on the object, we are close to what is already done with the barcode. So we could reach a price which is higher, but in the same order of magnitude than the one for barcode. There is also one thing that is important for chip presser FID compared to barcode. In the next slide. So, there is many ways to make a classification about uh, GPS RFID tags because there are many different technologies that has been used and I will speak only of one of those, 
We can make this classification by considering the different encoding techniques that we employ, the different materials also, and also the gen general design approach. I just want to speak about materials to give you some idea about that. So as we have already seen, uh, we can find GPS RFID tags based on different kinds of materials. Most of them are plastics films for question of price and fabrication. It's much more simple to print with, uh, with inject printer on plastic rather than on paper. But you can also have a piezoelectric substrate and it's also one kind of uh, cheapest of IT tag that has been introduced uh, many years ago. So I have some illustration uh, about that for each kind of uh, this, um, this material. So as I told you also, we can do uh, also uh, tags without any material, um, uh, conductive materials. And in that case, they can be realized only with paper or with metallic fit. So let's speak about uh, the, the most, uh, I would say, uh, way to encode information and cheapest tags. So it's relating to what we can see here. Uh, and it's also why I told you that cheapest tags, so the label that we can see here is in the tags on which I work are composed of many scatterers. So here we have four scatterers. Of course, the more we have scatterers, the more we could encode information. So it's why we, we try to increase the number of scatterers. But for each scatterer, of course, uh, we have realized a specific shape in order to have resonant scatterers. And resonant scatterers is really important for all the different parts of uh, what I'm going to speak uh, now, because it's, it's due to the, the, the quality factor of this resonator that uh, we are able to detect this tag in real environment. So here it's, uh, we can have many different kinds of uh, resonator. Here it's a simple microstrip uh, dipoles uh, as half wave resonator. And of course, if we have four scatterers like here, if we look at the backscattering wave in terms of frequency, we will have four peaks which correspond to these four resonance frequency. So about uh, this axis, axis, of course, uh, it could be different things. It could be the RCS and the radar cross section, but it could be simply the backscattering E field or even only the uh, one of the uh, one S parameter, if we use a simple VNA and one or two antenna, uh, if we are using a bistatic or monostatic configuration, this could be simply the S11 or S21 parameters. Uh, why? It's just because we don't encode information on the level of these peaks, but just on the resonance frequency. So when we save, we record the backscattering wave, in order to detect the tag ID, we will look for the resonant frequency and we will attach this resonant frequency to the slot that we can see here in that line. So for example, in, that, in this example, we have uh, one peak uh, in the second slot we will consider that it's one and we will do the same for all the peaks here. This resonant frequency with these scatterers are directly linked to this length L. So now if I want to change the tag ID, I just have to print another tags where I change, for example, only one 
length L. By changing this length, I change the resonance frequency, and of course, I will change the height. So this is a simple way to encode information. Of course, after we can do hybrid uh, coding by changing different parameters. Of course, we can change also the magnitude, but as I told you, it's not so easy. We can also control different things like the phase or different things. But most of the time, for tags that we can, that we want to detect in real environment for for application, this is the most robust way to encode information. So of course, uh, there is a objective way. Uh, between uh, the fact that if I have a tag ID, it's easy for me to generate the pattern, like for barcode, huh, when we want to print it. And now, if I have the backscattering wave, by detecting the resonance frequency, I will have the ID. So this means that I can uh, do identification based on this simple principle. So, from that, as we are going to see, what I have done during these maybe 10 last years was to demonstrate the practical and economic potential of chipless. And to do that, we have worked on many different fields. For example, on the compliance with RF emission and regulation, because here it's clear that in order to increase the quantity of information, we need a lot of frequency band. It's not possible to use only IMS band like in UHF RFID, it's really too small. So we need at least three or four gigahertz of band. And the only way to do that, if we want to be compliant with uh, regulation, is to send pulse, to use UWB band. And by this way, it's possible to use bands from three to 10 gigahertz. Uh, as I told you in the introduction, the reader that we use is totally different from classical UHF RFID reader. So we have developed our own reader, which is something like a radar, we, compatible with the regulation. We have worked a lot about uh, how to encode and to enlarge the number of bits that we can encode with a, a tag. This is clearly still a limitation in chipless RFID because it's still difficult in real environment to be able to encode more than 40 bits. 40 bits is what we have for classical uh, barcode. We have also worked a lot about uh, the orientation of reading, more exactly the robustness of detection, and we will see some example later. Uh, over, there is over, uh, aspects were very important also. Uh, main of a lot of things uh, are based on the possibility to have very low cost tags. Uh, and when we say low cost tag, is tags uh, with cost at least 10 times less than UHF RFID tags. So we have to reach this type of uh, uh, this type of cost for uh, unit tags, and it's something on which we are working. And also, how to add new functionalities to this chipless tag regarding to barcodes. We are very limited in for that. And I will also present many examples about that. So let's begin with uh, the encoding capacity. So I have presented one simple way to encode information. Uh, increase the number of, as I told you, there is different way, but if we want to be robust in terms of detection, most encode information only based on the resonance 
And after that, the idea is to use as much as possible uh, on a limited band, of course, huh, because as I told you, we have to work between three and 10 giga, but in practice is even difficult to be able to have a high, resonat high, high quality factor resonator uh, with uh, such pattern, uh, simple patterns, um, at higher with a frequency of resonance higher than six gigahertz. So most of the time we are limited from three to six. And in this band, we have to add as many as possible resonators. And if we want to increase the number of resonators, we have to uh, put them on a the very narrow band and to be able to do that, we have to uh, have uh, IQ resonator. So it's why most of the design on which we work are relating to the possibility to increase the, the quality factor. We will see later that the quality factor has also another impact, not only in terms of uh, the number of bits that we can encode, but also in terms of robustness of detection. So second aspect is about robustness of detection. So we, we have made a lot of work on that. Uh, I will just uh, speak about uh, a few of them. For example, one very classical one is if we want to be able to print our label on the object like a barcode, it means that our label will have no ground plane. So without ground plane, of course, most of the time we reduce the quality factor, which is not good. But also, we will, our resonance frequency will be directly impacted by the object, which is supposed to be unknown, of course. So it means that if we don't introduce specific techniques, it's not possible to read the tag because depending on the object, the resonance frequency will shift and we will have a different identification based on what I, I, I show you. So we have introduced many things. One very simple is to use uh, at least one uh, resonance scatterer, not to, to encode information, but just to improve the robustness of detection. So this resonance, this uh, scatterer uh, will, will be supposed to be known uh, so we, it will, it, it will be the same for all the tags, and by this way, uh, we can uh, shift all the peaks relating to this resonance of resonator of reference. So it's like if we were able to compensate the effect of the permittivity of the object, and it's what we see here. It means that um, when we, so the, due to the box, we have a shift on the resonance frequency compared to without, uh, which is in black. And now if we use this compensation, this correction, which has where we use this resonator of resonance, we can go from the dash line to the plain gray line here. And we see that we will find a gate the correct resonance frequency. So this is one technique. Another one, which is also very important, is to uh, to to read our tags in cross polarization. So we have seen previously when I I show you the first generation of tags here yeah, that. Most of the time, they were two antennas, and of course, they are in cross. So it means that, for example, we send a wave in that direction, and we will um, measure the backscattering wave in uh, at uh, uh, in this uh, plane, uh, in this direction, in order to isolate as much as possible the uh, the wave. Uh, for example, from the environment. So this is what we have done, but with the idea of uh, a tag without any antennas. Huh? So it means that we have uh, introduced some scatterers. 
where uh, which change the polarization of the wave. So it means that if we send a, polari a wave in vertical polarization, in in like we can see here, most of the objects who are surrounding us uh, have a clear orientation also. Uh, it means that they, are, they have a vertical or, oriented or, or horizontal polarization, most of them. So it means that the backscattering wave from this object will be all also in the same polarization as the emission. So if we use, we introduce a tag who has uh, the capacity to change the polarization, like is it uh, illustrated here in blue, by changing the orientation of the uh, receiver antennas, we will measure only the H polarization. And by this way, we will uh, remove a lot of part of the environment. So this can be modeled uh, simply uh, if we do if I write the equation of that, uh, we, we can see that uh, in the copolarization, we have one part which are directly linked to the presence of the object. But now if we use, we, we use a cross polarization measurement, we see that the, this object will be removed, uh, the presence of this object will be removed, and we will be able to detect something who are more related to the tag. Uh, in practice, we can consider that we have an attenuation of something like 20 dB, so, which is very important uh, uh, by this way. So we, we remove 20 dB of our object of, by using cross polarization uh, techniques like that, and this is very important. Uh, maybe a third techniques that we have introduced to, in order to read tag in real environment, and it's maybe the most important one, is uh, relating to the, the concept of time separation. And as you, you will see, this is directly linked to the fact that we are using very good resonator. So if we use the previous configuration, so measurement in cross, where we have a tag, but also different objects, who could be close to the tag or at different location. It's interesting to see the backscatter signal in time. And here we have isolated, so it's of course uh, schematic, we have isolated the contribution of the different uh, object. So the first things that we can see here, which is a, a huge peak, huh? if we send, we send a, a pulse, so uh, the backscattering wave is mainly composed of pulse. Huh? The first one is directly to the coupling and the mismatch that we can, the, the isolation that we have at the antenna level. So when we send a pulse, even if we use a very good high performance uh, antennas like the one that you have here hein, with uh, an isolation that could be more than 30 dB, you still have a direct reflection, which is this peak. If now we see at uh, an, uh, an after, so we, we run the, the simulation, for example, we will see over peaks here who are directly relating to the presence of object. So the first one, so the closest, closest to the antenna is the green object, so we will have first peak. And the second one, which is a bit far, will be here. Uh, what we can see here is that these objects, of course, are classical objects 
around us who are not designed, who has not been designed in order to resonate. So it means that the signal that we have so is like a quasi-optic reflection. So it's a image similar to the pulse. So it's why it's very limited in time, as you can see here. And now the most important thing is if we look at the behavior of our tags in time, we will see this kind of things. As we are working with IQ resonator, it means that the tag will resonate and will send, will, will uh, keep part of energy and backscattered uh, a part of it uh, in time with a, a sort of uh, exponential, uh, decreasing exponential. And if now we superimpose all this signal, which is what we measure, in fact, huh, uh, the measurement will be uh, direct to that, we can clearly see that if we do time getting, so if we choose uh, the T start and uh, T stop, uh, where we only have the contribution of the tag, it's a very simple way to remove much of the presence of the environment. And this is clearly what we still do uh, in order to be able to detect tags even when they are huge uh, objects just around the tag. So to do that, it's interesting to present, to work with the spectrogram rather than the, the time signal. So the spectrogram is just a frequency and time representation of the backscatter signal. And we will see the same thing, but also the, the resonance frequency. So this is a, a real measurement that has been done uh, where the tag was uh, surrounding with object and we see the different contribution. So first the coupling part, the presence of object and after the presence of the tags where we see the uh, resonant frequency and we also see uh, something very classic is that the quality factor uh, is dependent on the frequency and at higher frequency the quality factor is lower so it means that uh, the, the, we, we, we have signal on a limited time compared to uh, the first resonances. So based on this idea we have for example uh, prove that it's possible to detect tags uh, with sorry. Uh, because most of the time uh, uh, in radar, uh, what we do to isolate the tag uh, is to do an empty me measurement. So it means a measurement without the tag. And after we uh, subtract this measurement with the one where the tag is in front of the antenna. So it's a way to isolate the tag. But this has some limitation uh, because uh, in practical application, uh, we don't know the object uh, in front that we will have in front of the antenna. Uh, this object is uh, the, the object that we want to identify. So it's not possible to do anti-measurement like that. So uh, this work was interesting in the way that it has proved that it's compatible with uh, uh, real uh, real application. Uh, just to illustrate uh, these things, which are also very important, is uh, if we well, I think I, I, uh, when we look at uh, this representation. Uh, uh, so I, I only spoke about the 
quasi-optic uh, reflection due to the object, but we also have a quasi-optic reflection of the tag, for example, because it's totally metallic, and we also have a contribution at the early time part uh, due to this, uh, this, uh, this ground plane effect. And if we don't do anything, uh, we can see that uh, the backscattered wave is a superposition of uh, this quasi-optical uh, contribution and the resonant part. And just due to this superposition, we can have a shift in the resonance frequency when, for example, we just turn the tag. So it's uh, what we see here in green. And this is really uh, 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 bad things in cheapless RFID because uh, as we encode information on the resonance frequency, if now we see that by just turning the tag, we change the resonance frequency, for sure, we will have a huge limitation. But if now we use this idea of time separation in order to extract uh, the real uh, the resonance frequency and the quality factor, we will have this overcue, so something which are totally constant because we remove the, the, the presence of the environment. Um, to continue, uh, about uh, the different aspects on which uh, we have worked in order to show the, the, the practical implementation of this technology. So I, I told, I speak a, a little bit about the compliance with RF emission. So this is typically uh, the, the mask that we have to respect depending on the country also. So it's why we can consider that we have uh, 3 to 10 uh, gigahertz and uh, to be compatible with this mask we have to send pulse like that huh? and this pulse is quite uh, uh, small in time huh? because uh, it's uh, something the duration of this kind of pulse is uh, lower than one nanosecond and based on that we can be compliant with that so we have introduced a specific uh, reader for that uh, we can see here, for example, one part of this reader. Uh, this is just for the emission part of this kind of pulse. And also we have uh, work on the receiving re part. And at the end, uh, we were able to, uh, to have our own reader. Here you can see a comparison between uh, the measurement of our pulse made with the reader that we have developed and with an oscilloscope and we have very good uh, uh, comparison. So the tight cost, as I told you, is very important so for, for that. We have worked on many different kinds of printing process. The lowest, the lowest, sorry, the one which, which is uh, low in terms of cost is uh, flexography. It's what you can see here. So uh, it's interesting, but uh, the problem of flexography, it's, it's uh, not possible, not compatible with uh, uh, the possibility to print different patterns. Uh, most of the time we can print only one pattern. So if we want to uh, change the ID, huh, we have to change the pattern. So we have to add different step in order, for example, uh, with a laser or something like that, in order to change the pattern. So it's quite annoying. Uh, now uh, there are a lot of improvement in the possibility to print uh, press, enfin, metallic pattern like that. And uh, we can print uh, uh, with sort of inject printer uh, different kind of geometry uh, in order not to have such uh, trouble. Uh, one thing also important is the possibility to use this uh, approach for sensing. E even what we have proved is that we, we, as we, we work on a radar principle and uh, for sure when we are in the environment, uh, 
restricted environment like in an echoic chamber, we can even do sort of metrology. So it means that we can measure some physical quantities and I, I will show you some example. Here, what we have uh, observed is the resolution that we can have in terms of uh, displacement. For example, uh, the idea here was to see the minimum distance uh, that we can detect in terms of displacement. So we have work uh, on classical tags, as you can see here, and the result is that we can detect displacement of a few hundreds of microns, so larger, lower than one millimeter. So it means that we can be very accurate for uh, localization purpose. And I have some video at the end to show you this aspect. Uh, because we have used this principle in order to do gesture recognition. Uh, maybe just to, to illustrate uh, from a practical point of view what we are able to do today, I have this video. So this video uh, show uh, the reading of uh, different uh, uh, objects on which we put uh, uh, high quality tags. Huh? We will not see the tags on this video because most of the time the tag is inside, for example, envelope paper, something like that, because the purpose of this demonstration was to show that we don't need direct line of sign to read the tag contrary to the barcode. Uh, and we, you will see that uh, so the, re the reader is here, we don't see it. Huh? Uh, the reading is done uh, uh, through the, the, the table. The reading range, the reading area is, is uh, what we see here, the, the square, and we have something like 20 centimeters. It's like a, a, a box a cube of 20 centimeters square. And you will see that when we put the object with the tag into this area, we will detect the, the item and we will see on the screen, uh, we will see the image of the object because it had been saved previously. Okay. So you see also something that is very important for application so for this example, huh, we put directly the tag in, in, inside the, 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 the box huh, in order to, to see that we, we can do it through some objects. Same thing for that. So it's important here to see also the, the velocity, the, the speed that we can uh, obtain for such uh, detection, huh, which can be considered to be uh, uh, better than for barcode. Okay, so different uh, example. Again, we will see uh, the, the tag is inside. We can put it inside also uh, uh, an envelope like that, and we will still be able to read the tag when we are in the uh, the, the correct value. So this is a, a, a illustration of what, uh, so based on all the different uh, techniques, strategy that I show you, uh, what kind of uh, things that can be done today based on this technology. Uh, Alexandre, just to be sure, how, how many times, how uh, I can continue? Uh, I think you can um, continue here. It's, uh, it's very soon. So, how, how, okay, how because you, you can tell me if I'm too long because I still have a lot of slides. So, don't hesitate to tell me, and after I can. Uh, I I summarize about, the end. Okay. Uh, if you can uh, 
Uh, terminate in um, 20 minutes. It's perfect for, for us. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I will just uh, introduce a bit uh, what we have done these next, uh, these last maybe uh, three years in the field of the Scatter ID project. The idea was to introduce new functionalities, huh, as I told you, regarding to barcode. So one work package was uh, dedicated to the idea of writing and rewriting the label. So this is something that cannot be done with the barcode. And we have introduced something that can be uh, printed and uh, compatible with this idea for cheapless tag. We also have worked a lot on the idea of sensing and also about gesture recognition. So just to give you some info, basic information about all of that, I have some uh, illustration. The first one is uh, the idea that if we want, so here you can see uh, classical tags, which is a half long wave long dipole here. And the idea is to introduce in this um, shape one uh, thing that we call a uh, Cebran cell that has been introduced uh, in for memories. And these cells, is what you can see here. It's the possibility to create a filament when we uh, introduce a tension between the two electrodes. So what is very really interesting for in that is it's be stable. So it means that we keep the state, so the on or off state, even without any tension. So it's why it's really interesting for our application in GPS. And when we have such functionality, it's very really simple to, to put that into our label huh? uh, because everything has been done in order to be able to print it. And for example, if we change uh, one uh, state, as you can see here, huh? we, can, we will change the resonance frequency and of course we will change the ID. So it's why by this way we can uh, introduce the rewritable tags, and you can see some example here. So about something, uh, I will just speak about the main ideas. Main idea is when you have a, a classical uh, label composed of several scatterers, the idea is to, for example, uh, add on top of some of this resonator, uh, some material who will be sensitive to the physical quantity that we want to measure. And in that case, so in this example is humidity. Huh? So of course, depending on the presence or not of the humidity, uh, we will change the resonance frequency of this resonator. So by this way, uh, with the same kind of reader, we will be able to detect the change of humidity. But as we don't change anything relating to these two, we will keep the same ID. So it means that with this kind of label, we can do identification and sensing at the same time. And the last uh, part is relating to gesture recognition. And again, I will show you some video later. Uh, this is based on two ideas. The first is, as I told you, we with this radar approach, we can detect very accu accurately any displacement of the tag. So if we have the tag in our hand by, by doing some specific gesture, we will be able to detect it. And the, the other aspect is, of course, if we are in direct contact with the uh, scatterers, like you can see here with the finger, we will directly change the resonance frequency. So again, with a reader, we can detect these changes and we can use this label like a, 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 a cable. So I, I will continue uh, an illustration about that. Huh? Uh, it's clear that uh, this idea of gesture recognition is very important today. Uh, in our case, it's based on uh, this uh, idea and the fact that when we move our uh, labels or our scatterers, uh, just analytically, uh, if we use by doing two measurements, when the tag is uh, in that position and another one 
decomposition. By looking at the phase, we can directly detect the change in the, uh, the displacement, so the difference between D1 and D2, D0 and D1. And this is possible with uh, S parameter measurement. So now, what based on this idea, if we use a tag based on at least three scatterers, here we have five, we can do a sort of multilateralization in order to detect the position of the tag. So it's a bit different from what we, we use in practice because usually we have one object with several antennas. In our case, it's inverted. We have only one antenna, it's a reader one, but we have several scatterers, and for each scatterer, we are able to detect the variation in distance between the scatterer and the antenna. And then, based on that, we can compute a different equation, and we are able to detect the displacement. So to, to show the principle, we have used different kind of measurements. First, we put the tag on the 3D positional table just to be able to have no error on the displacements and to quantify the error that we have based on the RF measurements. And the, after that, we have implemented this idea in real, in real time with uh, the tag in the end to see what can be done. We have selected a limited number of gestures in order to prove the concept. Huh? So we have selected uh, three uh, circles in different planes and three translations. And the idea was to be able to detect uh, this kind of gesture based on what the user is doing in front of the antenna. So I will not speak about that. I will just present some uh, results. So the, the measurement bench with the 3D positional table is what you have seen here. Here, huh? here we just use an antenna with a, a, a classical VNA and the tag is on this arm here. And of course, what we will do is, yes, I will put here. So we, you have a real-time acquisition. You see, when we move the tag, we can directly compute in real time the displacement. And after, based on this, all these points, we can associate this to a gesture. In that case, it was a translation in the Z, Z direction. But of course, we have tried all the six different gestures. And here, what we will see here is a circle in the uh, X, Y uh, plane. So again, this measurement has been done in real time, and you see the presence of the, uh, the circle and the, the detection of the gesture. So it has been interpreted as a, a circle in the x, y direction. So after that, uh, we also have done uh, the result was good. Huh? Uh, even if we have not exactly the shape, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, we have enough information to detect uh, the gesture. We have done that with the N, and again, I have a small illustration about that. So the measurement setup is the same, but we have, uh, of course, removed the 3D positional table, and here we uh, just use our N in order to do the movement. So, of course, it's difficult to, to do exact uh, movement like it was the case with the 3D. But what we see here is, based on the algorithm that we have uh, developed, we were able to detect for each gesture the correct, uh, for, yes, for each displacement, the, correct, the corresponding gesture. In that case, we are looking at some translation in different direction. And now we will see the same thing, but con uh, relating to the, the circle. So the X, Y circle, and we have done, of course, the same. Uh, we want. So we don't have 100% of success, huh? but we have very good uh, success rate, which is higher than 90% 90 which is compatible with this kind of, uh, of uh, application.
so if I have a few minutes left, I will maybe just speak about this thing. Um, so as I told you, as we are working uh, with a radar approach, uh, we can do metrology. So we can measure some uh, physical quantity. We can uh, we have work a lot on temperature measurements, humidity measurement. But here, one thing that is quite interesting because very simple to understand is the measurement of the uh, thermal expansion of materials and more example of the one relating to metal. So what we have done, we of course for metrology we need to be in a very uh, isolated uh, environment. So uh, here we need to change the temperature hein, in order to change the dimension of the loop. So we use a, a climatic chamber with a absorbent in order to do our uh, contactless measurement hein, because we are still in in um, without any direct contact hein, in like a radar approach. And the idea is that uh, by using a, a loop, as you can see here, without any dielectric, hein, the loop is only composed, is only a, a metal. By changing the temperature, for sure, we will change the, the, the length. And as we are able to measure very accurately the resonant frequency of the loop based on analytical model, because we are using a very simple uh, geometry, we can uh, detect, in fact, the evolution of the loop, the length, and after that, to detect the uh, CTE, so the coefficient uh, of thermal expansion of the metal. So for that, we have realized the same loop with different uh, kind of metal, zinc, copper, nickel, and we have done this measurement. Here, you can have some results. For example, with our climate chamber, we have changed the temperature from 30 to uh, 55 degrees. For each temperature, we have measured the resonant frequency. We have converted this resonant frequency to a, 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 a distance, a, 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 the, the variation of the length of the loop, huh? so the elongation. And based on that, so if we compute, in fact, the slope of this Q, we are able to uh, detect the uh, CTE A, so the coefficient of thermal expansion. We were able to uh, realize this loop with pure metals in order to be able to compare the, this coefficient with uh, what is given by in the data sheet. And the result that we have obtained is in very good agreement with the one from the data sheet. So why this uh, result is for me very interesting is because in fact, this show that we can be very accurate in the measurement because it's not written here, but here you can see that to compute this coefficient, we need to be able to measure some variation of uh, a one geometrical parameter that could be a few microns. Uh, we, we, were, we are able to measure, for example, a variation of three microns uh, of the loop size. And three microns in terms of resonant frequency is uh, uh, less than one megahertz. So, of course, as we are using VNA, we are very uh, stable in the uh, uh, frequency measurements. So, it's compatible with this kind of approach. And at the end, we can uh, detect coefficients who uh, usually are not uh, measured with this kind of approach. Nobody has uh, done that in RF before. Uh, in 
three minutes, I can just pick, uh, uh, give you more example about uh, what we have done in terms of uh, uh, rewritable uh, chipless tags. So here is just some illustration that we have done. Uh, you have seen previously the, the idea of uh, we, we, we look for sort of filament uh, uh, between is in contact between the two. We will have a current path, so it means that we are in on state, and by changing the tension, we can break this filament, so we go back to off state. So by that, we can realize, in fact, RF switch, but also a reconfigurable chipless type. Uh, here you can see just one video who, who show the formation of this filament, so here we are aluminum and here copper and you see uh, in real time uh, the formation of this filament and when the filament is in contact with the second electron everything will stop and we will keep uh, this uh, on state uh, so it means that now i can remove the tension that we have applied between the two electrodes and we still have uh, on state and we could break it just by changing the tension one time. So uh, with this idea, we have realized different kind of uh, RF circuits. So first we have realized classical RF switch. So uh, we have uh, added these CBRAM cells into uh, CPW line. We have done the same on paper substrate. We have realized, on, based on this principle, uh, different kind of filters or antennas. And the most interesting for this talk is the possibility to do uh, chipless tags uh, with the idea of changing the resonance frequency. So we have seen uh, that uh, the resonance frequency is directly linked to the geometry. In this case, in fact, we have introduced our CBRAM in one part of the resonator, so it means that we have introduced these electrical circuits with the possibility to change this resistance. So it means that when we have a very low resistance, we short circuit the capacity. So it's like if we there were nothing, but when there are, when the resistance is um, is high we will have the presence of the capacity and the presence of the capacity will ch shift the frequency. So by this way, we can control the resonance frequency and we can change the, uh, the code. So here you have some results, some of the first results that we have done. Huh? It's a kind of uh, C shape where the, the CBRAM cell has been implemented here. And here we can see the two different states that we have obtained. So in red, for example, is when the, we are in on state, the resistance has been measured at uh, 12 ohm. We have done two sets, first 12, 7, 15, and the, the off state is here, and we see a clear shift uh, of a few hundreds of mega between the two. Of course, if we want to have more information, we can use several scatterers at, at different resonance frequency in order to increase the uh, total number of bits. Okay, so if you are interested in this uh, field, we have published uh, different uh, papers and also books. And for example, um, we have some books uh, relating to the uh, some theoretical aspect about the R thesis, the encoding principle, the reader part, and also uh, this year has been uh, published uh, one relating to the reconfigurable uh, RFID, G plus RFID, and also we have worked a lot about authentication, but I didn't speak about that in this talk. So I will uh, stop here. I think uh, I have presented uh, what is chipless RFID and uh, some different uh, uh, functionalities that, uh, that could be uh, obtained 
based on this uh, very simple approach, which is uh, only a, a radar approach where, of course, here we, we have designed our uh, target. Thank you. If you have any question, don't hesitate. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, lecture. We have some... Okay. Uh, C2, uh, you can open your microphone and put the uh, question on the chat as you want. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Professor Perk, for the nice presentation. Uh, I would like to know... Uh, mm, so, uh, chipless RFID detect a large frequency band is.